Yes, Mr. Case where um, there was an agreement plus detrimental reliance. My lord, yes. So it doesn't, it's, really, it's, doesn't really bear on the points that we're deciding. My lord, it, well, insofar as the, it's relevant to ground three and ground three alone. That's, that's the point. Right. And I, I was halfway through dealing with ground three, which yep. is the there wasn't detriment or the final detriment. Yeah. The lady friends handed to me about 10 minutes ago two further uh, bundles. One consists of um, 64 pages of correspondence um, described as a disclosure at trial, yes. which I've not uh, had a chance to review. And there's also a bundle of authorities um, with me, which consists, I think, of yeah. nine, eight authorities, mm. um, uh, say nine of which um, uh, my friend has been informing me that he was going to arrive before. So, well, Lord, I have proposed that we, I would speak for about an hour, firstly finishing off on ground three, making a short reply on the detrimental reliance point from yesterday, grounds one and two, and then dealing with our amended response notice. Yes. Um, and I, that's what I propose to do, subject to any views expressed by the cause. It may be that um, Len Friend's arguments um, on the amended response notice are somewhat more elaborate um, if he intends to take the call to those number of authorities. But I'm, I intend to use the time that I have today in the way that I've just indicated. Right. So if I can then just finish off on um, ground three, I had already dealt with two issues that arose out of ground three on the detrimental reliance. The first was the general rule about the standard of appellate review and I took the court to Sagas. Yes. I also took the court to two authorities, Austin and Keel and O'Neill and Holland, yes. which deal with points which we say technically don't strictly arise under the ground, because there is no ground which alleges an error of law by the trial judge on, on the nature of detriment. Um, but I dealt with them for the sake of completeness in any event. I would, if I can return to the ground, before I do so, my lord, I just want to re-emphasise some points which are made in our skeleton, which we say um, really um, emphasise that so much of the factual premise upon which my learned friend rests his case on ground three is simply inconsistent with the facts as found by the trial judge. And there is no ground of appeal on either appeal which seeks to attack any finding of fact. And my Lord, of course, I'm referring to the reliance um, <coughs> on one half of a sentence in my client's witness statement, yeah. paragraph 19 statement. Your Lordship, my lady, you will be familiar with that sentence. I'm not going to take you to yes. it. But of course, we say that the only possible what realistic and sensible construction of that sentence is that she was aware she had no matrimonial claim. There are no claims for maintenance known to the law outside statute, outside 
by the matrimonial coordinator. And with the greatest respect for my friend, uh, he took you on a tour of some islands. But I say they were some very isolated islands in an ocean of evidence that is recorded in the judgment and in the, in the papers that say that Miss Hathaway clearly did believe she had a claim. That is the finding of fact made by the trial judge. Miss Hathaway was cross-examined on this paragraph. Notwithstanding that cross-examination, the judge made the findings of fact that he did. And so, <coughs> we, my Lord, for your references, at paragraph 34 onwards of our, of our schedule, we set out that um, <coughs> a few of the other islands, as it were, but the islands which indicate that, that the evidence was um, entirely justifying the, judge, the trial judge's finding. We don't have a transcript of the cross examination. Well, no. And of course, if one was seriously seeking to challenge a final fact on a particular part of the evidence where a witness was cross examined about that, at the very least, we would accept yeah. um, And realistically, even if, um, if I dare to suggest your lordships aren't with me on that, uh, if the court is minded to entertain uh, uh, some questioning of the finding of fact, the only remedy, it seems to me, that the court could do would be a retrial, because yeah. this court's not in a position to, um, <clears throat> uh, to make a finding on the evidence itself. So I, I say the only proper way for this court to approach question of detrimental reliance is on the findings of fact, in particular at paragraph 65, 66, the well-known passages in the, in the trial judge's judgment where he talks about the nature of detriment yep. and indeed the paragraphs <coughs> Well, having dealt with that, I move on to the attempt to argue that um, where the um, claim which begin, where the detriment is said to consist of, either in whole or in part, a compromise of a legal claim, then detriment is no longer an evaluative exercise for the trial judge, but a matter of law. And, and I say that's effectively what ground 3.1 seeks to assert, seeks to argue. Um, and I say that that is um, simply wrong for four reasons. Firstly, my lord, there is absolutely no authority for it. <clears throat> Secondly, my lord, my lady, it risks the court being drawn into the trial within a trial uh, and all of those drawbacks, which in a contractual context, the law has always run away from, uh, and there's the passage that we rely on in our skeleton from, I think, a case in the 1890s that, um, that makes that point. Um, <clears throat> uh, the Mars and New Zealand author of the State Company on page, paragraph 21 of our skeleton, you have, otherwise you'd have to try the whole cause to know if a man had a right to compromise. And uh, even if the argument is, well, you need to uh, produce some building blocks to um, I say that that simply doesn't make the finding that there was a claim a matter of law. There, there, must, there must be cases where what is compromised is so obviously non-existent that the court can say so. Well, Lord, yes. Well, that would be a matter for looking at the evidence. Again, I mean, if the judge, the judge looks at the evidence and uh, is concerned that there's no if the judge is concerned that the claim has not been properly articulated, then the judge can say, well, how have you put your case? None of that was gone into. As I said, there's a pleading point here, and there's a substantive point. You, you sometimes get this sort of analogous question in a, a claim that solicitors have been negligent in allowing a limitation period to expire. If there was obviously no claim, then that's the end of that. But if there might have been, or there was an arguable claim, then you can go on to... Deal with the question of and the trial judge's finding was that there was an arguable claim. I mean, my learned friend referred repeatedly to a particular sentence in paragraph 66 saying that he, the judge found it was a weak claim. He didn't say that. He said it may have been a weak claim. Um, 
So he wasn't expressing a view on the merits or otherwise of the claim. He was simply saying, um, I don't know uh, the merits of the claim, but I'm, I'm satisfied, he was saying, that there was a claim that was live that both parties thought had some merit to it, and they did a deal to resolve that claim. Yeah. Um, my Lord. I was going to say, the judge actually deals with desisting from making a claim under the Children Act. He says... There couldn't have been a claim. I mean, that is a that is a conclusion of law. It's not a it's not a factual thing. But 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 I'm, I'm just cavilling at your suggestion that it can, there can never be a question of, of law involved. I think you you can say, as a matter of law, what is put forward as a possible claim simply obviously doesn't work. But that's not what he did here. My lord, what I say therefore is that there will be some claims where that what what the lordship. What we should say is right that um, if someone makes a claim that would be struck out because it discloses no cause of action, yeah. then then clearly um, um, a decision on that, or if the judge gets that wrong, I accept that that would be a matter of, of law. But where there is no suggestion that this is a claim not recognised by law, um, <clears throat> then. Um, there, where a trial judge makes a decision that there was a claim, um, then I say that's a matter of, of evaluation. Yeah. Just like everything else that being <coughs> more objections. Um, <clears throat> I say that's the one exception. And here, I say that there's no suggestion um, that it was argued that there was no claim recognised um, by the law to be shared. And we, we've, we've said we both before, in our skeleton, this court and also below, that there are a number of routes to do that. We don't have to do that, but for instance, um, we refer to a case called Paul and Constance, which says you can have an oral declaration of personal property, of like a bank account in that case. Um, and I'm sure uh, members of the bar who have been before this court will have had experience of other claims of personal property, in some cases involving houseboats and sort of endowment policies. The, the idea that these are claims that um, are not known to the law, it seems to me, are. Um, So, my Lord, I was um, attempting to say there were four reasons why uh, that, in the context of this case at least, uh, the argument that it must be a question of law is wrong. Um, the other matter, the third matter, is um, that although we haven't got it in the bundle, and although it's a proprietary civil case, in terms of detriment, um, it's Gillette and Holt, the Lords, and I'm sure we're all be familiar with it. There's the famous passage in the, in the speech of the judgment of the Justice Robert Walker, where he says detriment is not a narrow or technical concept, it must be substantial, and where the detriment is uh, established is part of a broad inquiry as to whether it's unconscionable um, in that context to allow repudiation of the assurance. So that again is the general approach to um, detriment. And I say that. Um, unless we're dealing with a wholly exceptional case where the claim is one that would have been struck out as disclosing no cause of action, um, it is wrong to import technical or narrow concepts into what otherwise is a broad inquiry. Um, the other, as it were, pleading point in relation to this... Well, that's well, what, if I may say so, that's why I'm a little bit surprised you haven't pursued in your respondents' notice in this court your points about payment of the mortgage interest and the outgoing. It's a broad, holistic inquiry. I might have thought that that formed part of the picture, but you're not pursuing that. My Lord, no. Um, it was obviously a matter that your Lordship conceived yep. at trial, and um, there was the the other matter that my, my client said that she arranged her financial affairs on mm. the strength of, of that. Mm. Um, but uh, I'm on the horns of our dilemma there, and as Justice Carr said at the end of his judgment, you know, uh, when when I was seeking to uphold his decision, the trial judge's decision, I would say it's a matter of evaluation. Of course, when I seek to attack it, I'm saying you got it totally wrong. And it's exactly the same point there. My Lord, we, we say that uh, well, we don't need to do that. There's a perfectly adequate finding of detrimental reliance in any event. Um, so, my Lord, that's what I say about ground 3.1 that um, detriment is this uh, broad uh, concept uh, and is not to be infused with. Uh, narrow or technical rules depending on the nature of detriment alleged. And I, and 
I take my Lord uh, the Tristan's point with that narrow exception, someone <coughs> seems to say that the claim itself would have been struck out as disclosing no cause of action known to the law. My Lord, if I could move on then to ground 3.2, which alleges um, that the defendant, Miss Hathaway, had no claim to the shares and accepted as such in her evidence. Well, I'll, I'll just pass on the second part of that because I've already dealt with that. And it's um, uh, not <coughs> uh, a factual premise that this court can properly entertain. But in terms of the no claim to the shares, uh, I say again that is a matter of um, evaluation. Uh, and of course, um, <coughs> the, the right response would have been, uh, as I indicated yesterday afternoon, my lord, if, if it was unclear or if the defendant if Mr. Hudson was unable to respond to the notion that there was a claim, it was perfectly open to him to serve a Part 18 request and say, you say you have a claim, what claim is it? What basis do you make the claim? Please provide some generic points of claim or something which indicate uh, that nature. So if necessary, we could apply or say that it would have been a claim that we would struck out. So as I say, that's, I say this is effectively... If, if it is saying that we're on, the court cannot, in any case, where, forgive me, I'll start that again. I think what I said is it's a point that's made too late. And if it is the case that someone wants to run that argument, to say this judge at trial will not be able to properly assess whether there's detriment, then the right thing to do is to seek a case management order or sort of start a request yeah. so that the trial judge has got all the arguments in front of him. And now it's So that deals, I say, with um, paragraph 3.2. Um, just a couple of points that arise out of that, um, because there was some reference to um, burden of proof in my own friend's um, uh, submissions yesterday. And my Lord, what I say is that there is a passage um, in the judgment of from Judge Wharton at paragraph 66. It's at full bundle, um, page. 202. And it's the sentence, it may have been a weak claim, so um, it's <coughs> um, the sentence I've already taken you to already. Yeah. Second part of it was, um, I cannot be convinced it's a non-claim. Now, all I say about that is that is not any form of reversal of the burden of proof. It's simply perhaps a slightly listed expression in an extemporary judgment that the judge accepts that there was a claim, even if and he rejected the suggestion that there was a non-claim or no claim at all. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll move on to ground 3.3. Ground 3.3, I find it, is um, <coughs> this idea that because this deal was unenforceable, um, Miss Hathaway had not given up any right to sue that she may have had or irrevocably changed her legal position. So, Again, dealing with the last part of that, we've dealt with the test for detriment. Um, <coughs> we say that in any informal compromise where there is quid pro quo, if one party gives up something, um, <coughs> then the, the dropping of a claim or the promise not to pursue a claim um, <coughs> is, uh, does become irrevocable for the reasons that my lady, Lady Judge Sandra, referred to yesterday when um, my lady friend invited the court to consider what would happen if my client were to now sue or make a claim in relation to the shares. It's, now, in relation to this point, my lord, I do want to just quickly take the court to Ely and Robson. There's a. We got that somewhere? Well, it's a 36 family bundle. Oh, that's a slim one we got today. Oh, yes. <coughs> And it's uh, tab two, it's part, under the divider in there, uh, 
Um, my Lord, this case yeah. was an unusual case where there was a property, forgive me if I told you to paragraph um, two on the second page. Um, they are a cohabiting couple. Initially, they move into a property in her name, that's Ashley Road. Paragraph three, we then see that he buys a property in his sole name. Uh, and at paragraph four, subsequently, Ms. Robson bought a property in her name. So there were three properties in dispute, potentially, on the breakdown of their relationship. Two in the defendant, Ms. Robson's name, and one in the name of Mr. Ely. Um, at paragraph six, one can see that the, the first set of proceedings begin with Mr. Ely seeking possession of the property in his name against Miss uh, Robson, and then she counterclaimed for a declaration that she was a, um, entitled to a half share in that property. Yeah. If one <coughs> turns on to paragraph seven, you can see that there was a trial listed for the middle of September 2007, but as the judge found, um, the parties met in the park to try and settle their claims, and did so. Um, <clears throat> and the terms of that settlement are set out in paragraph 6. In effect, um, Ms. Robson was going to be allowed to continue living in that property until two of her relatives died. At that point, um, <clears throat> that he would have a... Um, I mean, the, the, the terms are set out in paragraph 8, I'm sorry. Um, he would have a, a life interest, and then she'd have a 20% uh, remainder interest. And, the, sh and the, the claims that he has made, or intimated he won't, might make, to the property in her name were relinquished. And unusually, what happened was that the solicitors set out the deal that they understood had been reached. Uh, there was a letter to the court to say, We've settled, vacate the trial. Um, the judge, um, on this paragraph 10, vacates the trial and directs it to be relisted, and no one ever relists it, and no consent order or no time schedule is formally drawn up, no deed of release or anything like that is done. In due course, the relatives who were living with Ms. Robson died, and Mr. Ely said, Right, well, your right to live in my property has come to an end. He sought possession. My Lord, the, <coughs> the point that I um, rely on particularly is that um, paragraph 17, Mr. Ely uh, pleads the, the compromise that he said took place uh, in part. Ms. Robson denied that there was any such deal. Uh, and uh, paragraph 39 on appeal. One can see there the judge's summary to Justice Kitchen's uh, judgment. 39. Paragraph 39. Um, you can see the arguments made that there was, um, although they had agreed in principle, uh, it was going to be subject to some form of um, <clears throat> formal agreement, and therefore they did not uh, anticipate the terms they had discussed to be immediately binding. And that argument was rejected uh, at paragraph 40. And so, my Lord, I suppose the, the argument that we make in relation to Ian Wilson is it's, in a way, similar to the compromise uh, in this case, that, albeit that um, in Ian Robson there were, on both sides, as it were, there were two, uh, there were interests in land that were subject to Whereas in this case, it's an interest in land and an interest in shares. Um, we say that, as a result of analysis of Ely and Robson, that the, insofar as Mr. Ely had any interest in the properties in the name of um, Ms. Robson, um, by virtue of their deal, uh, he effectively disposed of his proprietary interest, if he had any. And that's exactly what we say is what happened by virtue of the compromise here. That <coughs> in circumstances where Mr. Hudson um, not only um, negotiated for and got the deal that he wanted, but then affirmed it subsequently 
in 2016 and 2018, um, we say that the GL extinguished her proprietary interest um, in the shares and or active uh, disposition of any such interest in shares to him. Yeah, so we, the, we re the reasoning, Lord Justice Kitchen's reasoning is really in 42 and 43. Oh, yes. Mr. Ely relied on the oral agreement by not pursuing his claim and by permitting Mrs. Robson, Miss Robson, to continue to live there. And so uh, <coughs> that is, um, as it were, um, the detriment as a result of their informal agreement. Both of them were out to rely on their detriment. They gave up the claims that they had to each other's property. Uh, and that made, and it was intended to be immediately binding on them, there was no further assurance required. Um, and as a result of that, um, each is interested in the other's assets were extinguished. And we say it's directly. <coughs> so, <coughs> going back to the, the hypothetical situation and then going possibly yesterday, where the court was invited to consider, it, consider the position if Ms. Hathaway were to sue uh, now. First of all, my friend stated rather coyly, well, Mr. Ha Mr. Hudson might have a number of defences. And I, I suspect. They are not unrelated to the practical difficulties of litigating about events a decade on in any event. But just, just staying with the, the um, hypothetical or counterfactual for a moment, assuming he had shot, sold those shares, uh, which Miss um, Hudson would have asserted a proprietary interest to, he would likely have sold them for value um, to a third party without notice or any claim. So um, I think that's a pretty safe assumption to make in these circumstances. So um, the idea that there's any for the property claim is um, uh, but your, your fair. point is that this is this was not a promise not to sue. This was something. This was uh, an exchange of emails by which Miss Hathaway gave up her claim to the shares. Oh, yes. And, <clears throat> and oh, whether that's a Section Fifty Three One C assignment or whatever interest she might have had doesn't really matter. Um, so I say that this counterfactual, as I say, we say at paragraph 46, the submission that she could still sue is both legally wrong and just wholly unrealistic. Yeah. Right. My Lord, in terms of the, the additional grounds which uh, were the subject of the application which Lord had granted yesterday, the ground 3.4 is in these terms, no detrimental reliance in the form of having given up an opportunity to negotiate an interest in the shares or pension as opposed to making a claim for them which pleaded or alleged. And we say that's simply just a bad point. The wording of the defence and counterclaim at paragraph 15.2 for the court's reference, that's at page 2.6, yeah. is perfectly wide enough to cover that point. And clearly the judge thought so. The final um, <clears throat> point is ground 3.5, the new ground 3.5, uh, and that's this. In any event, giving up an opportunity to negotiate for something one has no claim to is too speculative and insubstantial to amount to detriment to support a constructive trust. There are two things there, my Lord. Um, one is the factual premise is simply yes. not open, we say, to the, the appellant to argue because it's directly contradictory to the facts as found. Um, <clears throat> Secondly, well, is that so? I mean, the way you put your case was you said, on the one hand, there's a legal claim, and on the other, there is or may be a moral claim. And I think this ground is directed at your assertion that the, the moral claim is somehow freestanding. So I say that again, um, this is a matter of evaluation for the trial judge. Your Lordship, my lady, will recall in the judgment um, the the fact that Mr. Hudson was not someone who had stood on his legal right throughout the separation. There's a particular uh, reference to paying in excess of his liability on the child support. And those were all matters, it seems to me, the judge was entitled to take into account. Um, <clears throat> and the tone of the 31st of July email is very different from the tone of earlier emails. Um, and what we don't know is, and what we can't know, is how um, um, Mr. Hudson would have responded had Miss Hathaway put a uh, response back. What we, what we do know is that the trial judge made that finding a fact on the evidence, it's an evaluative decision on the evidence as a whole as a whole, um, and it's simply, I would say, not open for this court to review um, at, at, on a second appeal of that evaluative decision. Well, those 
are my submissions on ground three. I want to make a few points just in response to some points my friend made on the detrimental reliance point, because it, uh, although I'm the respondent, I've been treated as the appellant, as far as that's concerned, if I may. So just a, a few... Well, be short about it, because well, you, you, you are the, you are the uh, respondent on this one. So well, the first thing I, I'd say is that Maloney Friend makes a big play about the fact that equity is some coherent body of property law rules. And I say that the law of constructive trust is, is anything but that. One has to think of secret trust. One has to think of um, uh, the principle in Rachel Cohen Bell's theory that in equity will not permit a statute to be used as instrument of fraud, where there are real issues about how dispositions comply with those statutory provisions. And so the idea that there is just some coherent um, <coughs> structure and to um, uphold Mr. Justice Carl's judgment would be giving offence to that. I say it is simply not right. No. Secondly, um, I would caution against the unthinking use of extra maxims. Um, Equity and loss assist the volunteer, well, as we know from those two areas, secret trusts and Russia and Bowsted, um, equity tells sometimes assist the volunteer. Well, then a friend took the court to a, a case about imperfect gifts. Um, now, um, there is a considerable body of law now in relation to that, in my recollection, it's Pennington and Wayne, where um, the court says um, equity will not. Um, complete and imperfect gift, but before long equity has tempered the wind for the shorn land, and there are cases about what happens where someone has nearly uh, made a gift and not quite completed it. So again, um, the maxims can be mislead. My Lord, the third point I wish to make is this. Well, then a friend seems to accept that um, the court, or an equity interest can um, make a second ambulation from, to use the Barnes and Phillips analogy, from 75-25 to 85-15, without the need for detrimental reliance. And I say that um, there's no difference in my submissions to an ambulation from joint tenants or tenants from equal shares, to, to unequal shares, to further unequal shares. Well, my fourth point is in relation to um, uh, severance, which my learned friend made some point about. The point that I would make about severance is that, as far as I recall my land law, um, severance uh, in allows for severance by mutual agreement. And there is authority that says that agreement need not be in writing, need not be a contract, um, and so there is no difficulty with the idea that um, severance can take place by the court finding either that there was an express agreement or indeed infer severance from mutual conduct. So both how, how does that help you? Well, Lord, if there was severance of a beneficial joint tenancy, it results in 50-50 tenancy in common in equity. Well, Lord, the second point I want to make about that is that in a generality of cases, um, the mere fact of severance may well amount to detriment. Because it is a different position to be an owner of 50% than it is to be an owner of the a joint owner of the whole. So you mean you've given up your right of survivorship? Is that your point? Oh, yes. That won't assist my client because she, the, the, my, the idea that she's giving up the opportunity to get the whole when she gets the whole is not right. But in a in generality of cases, it may well be argued that severing the move from beneficial joint tenancy to any shares is is a change of position. Oh, right. <clears throat> My lords, the next point I wish to make is in relation to um, uh, the notion that there is one law of property or one law of trusts. Um, the passage that we've taken, both my friend and myself have taken the court to, uh, about um, that in the speech of Walker in uh, Jones and Kern, it begins with this phrase, at a high level of generality. Mm. Um, so 
just in my submission, that doesn't really help one way or the other. I do say that the very fact that what we call Proposition A is uncontentious means that there is a different regime in uh, domestic cases without um, a declaration of trust. And I say it does no um, violence to the categorization or the overall scheme of the law of trust to include the um, matters that I uh, say in Proposition B. Two other things, my lord, in relation to that. Um, my lord, in relation to acquaintance and tender, just a very short point. It was accepted in that case, this is the abandonment case, it was accepted in that case that even though the, the claimant who ended up being entitled to the whole process and who had put in all of the initial purchase costs. It was accepted that on acquisition, the parties were joint tenants. Yeah. Um, and all the conduct after acquisition, in terms of um, meeting the liabilities, is exactly the same sort of conduct that I referred to in Barnes and in Jones. It's completely equivocal. It is equally consistent with owning an equal share and claiming extra. Had 40 minutes now, Mr. My Lord, yes. So those are all the points I want to make in relation to the reply. My Lord, in terms of the amended respondent's notice, you'll see how it's put. Um, and I'll <coughs> make it just a couple of points, if I may, take you to the actual communications themselves. They're identified um, within right, the... Mr. Leonard, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I think I'm entitled to a reply on the second or on the third ground. Um, Will I be able to make that now, or shall I wait until Mr. Horton has? I think you should wait until Mr. Horton's finished. And well, the, the wording actually contains the. Sorry, what are we looking at? So it's the, the loose piece of paper. Yes. The wording of the notice, yeah. and that contains the references to those emails themselves. Um, yes, we looked at these yesterday. I think. Well, yeah, so, and the, the, the points that I emphasise in relation. To is the loose bit of paper, paragraph B, when it says section 5331A, is that meant to be 5331A or should it be 5331C? Um, well, my lord, 5331A was first to an interest in land. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to put 5331A and or C, but to 5331A uh, says no. Um, Interest in land should be created or disposed of, I think, by uh, signed right unless by signed writing. So I think it, it applies arguably to, to both. But. But in the alternative, you say 531C, do you? My oh, lord, yes. But if it's satisfied, obviously, for the purpose of 531A, which is to say no interest in land can be created or disposed of except by writing signed by the um, yeah. So, <coughs> the, the, question, the question is whether it's a disposed dis disposition. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, the, just the, the points that I had to raise in relation to those, the emails, I say, are at page 45 and 46. Cool bundle. Oh, sorry, forgive me, on the supplemental. Um, main supplemental bundle. So the language of the 31st of July email is taken, keep it. Um, so we say that it's dispositive. Um, likewise, this is the, the passage beginning with the words the liquid cap. There's um, a number of um, say active verbs in that paragraph. There is also the point that I made yesterday which is the passage as for will. That um, is either a declaration of trust that as from this point he will have no interest <coughs> nor will his surviving spouse. Um, or again I say it's, it's clarifying that it's intended to be and what I say, my 
final order is essentially that the, the offer is made subject to Ms. Hathaway confirming her acceptance. On page 46, we have her response of the 12th of August. Sorry, why do you say it's an offer? Well, it, it's, um, it's conditional, I say, upon her giving up her claim to the shares. Well, if it's conditional, it can't be dispositive, can it? Well, not always the same. Well, one could do it either one of these ways. Either of these is a straightforward disposition, which... Um, <clears throat> Where's the condition? <coughs> Am I going to retract that, Mark? I, 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 I take the Lordship's point. It is essentially... Um, Here's what's going to happen. You have no claim to my shares. I have given you my given you my interest in the house and the other assets described. Um, and it is confirmed um, by the email that begins on S46, which confirms Miss um, Hathaway's understanding of the uh, arrangement. And you can see on page 46, under about three quarters of the way down the page, um, he says again, under this arrangement, I have no interest whatsoever in the house. Yeah. Right. So those two together, we say, are either dispositive or a declaration of trust which comply with the section. My Lord, the only authority that I rely upon um, is, in this context, the, the Golden Ocean authority again model that's in our SIM politics family bundle that's the first authority this was a case about a charter party there was a dispute about whether there was a concluded main contract and that was found uh, to have been concluded and subsequently there was also an issue about whether there had been a guarantee given by a member of the same group of companies <coughs> Justice Tomlinson points out that it was common ground that you could have an electronic signature. My Lord, I say that um, this is um, this builds on other authorities. This is a case which has been 
we've tried not to deluge your, your, your ship over with authority, but there are other authorities which follow this. For instance, commercial case which says variations of contract may only be agreed with signed writing, and that's business justice mails which applies this and says an email uh, with um, right. which is intended to authenticate the um, uh, communication will amount to a variation of a written contract. So I say that it, it, the principle, having been conceded, was nevertheless rightly conceded and approved by the court. The court wasn't bound to approve this concession. Um, <clears throat> But, um, there's plenty of authority on it anyway. Um, there's, there's, there's a more recent case called Mater and Pereira, where it's first instance, it's His Honour Judge Pelling, um, where the so-called signature was actually at the top of the page, and it was the email. Uh, yes. My recollection is that that case was, in fact, referred to in argument. I've got the weekly law reports. Um, Pereira and Mater, 2006. Yep. Yep. There are others as well. There's one of the Cornwell's about ticking the box on a website. There's another one about Section 2 of the 89 Act. Well, yes. So the argument was that you can see um, paragraph 31, the first argument, three lines down, it's not a signature at all, but a salutation and one delivered in a matey or familiar fashion, and the court deals with that. Uh, and secondly, if it's a signature, it's only a signature of a communication, not. Uh, signature um, effectively contract guarantee and then the court rejects that point as well. Um, one can see in paragraph 32 the reference to the touchstone. Was it um, added to the document uh, with the intention to authenticate the document? Uh, and we say that when one looks at the documents that we have, that test is satisfied. Yeah. And all, uh, I say that is the um, um, long and short of it. And it doesn't matter that it's an email within an email because the signature's there anyway. Well, if it did matter, it, it, it no longer matters because it's confirmed by the 9th of September. Yes. But I, I say, I, I agree with you, um, I, it, it doesn't matter in that context. But even if it did, it's, it's subsequently confirmed. So that's why we put it in our response notice in that way. Mm. And well, I, I take the point very quickly, and I say it is. Um, um, <coughs> Yes, Mr. Devon. Well, Lord, I'll begin, if I may, with a few points in reply on the ground three point. There was a reference to O'Neill and Holland it being pointed out that it was a, um, a, a property that didn't belong to the claimant, or that didn't belong to the defendant, that she gave up the opportunity to receive. Um, it's worth pointing out that she also gave up the opportunity to continue to live there rent-free, and that is in the uh, report at page 691 of the bundle at letter F. 691? 691 is the bundle reference. Letter F is on the side of the page. My own friend also took your lordship to Grant and Edwards and to a passage that said, where there is a bargain between the parties, if you do what you've promised to do, then that's going to be good detriment. Yeah. But of course, that passage in Grant and Edwards is all about the bargain theory as opposed to the detriment theory which were the two competing theories at that time as to how constructive trusts are set up. What we see in the argument in Lloyd's, the argument in Lloyd's Bank and Rosset, is all about which is the right theory. Is it the Gissing detriment theory or the Grant and Edwards bargain theory? And the decision that Lord Bridge makes in Lloyd's is to uphold the detriment theory. There is no reference to quid pro quos or bargains uh, in the judgment of the House of Lords in Lloyd's. So the detriment theory wins. All that uh, material about bargains goes. 
So in my submission, that's not a, no longer a good point about the nature of detriment. It doesn't, there's no special rule that detriment can be lesser, insubstantial in those circumstances. And of course, if, if there were, it would be um, um, potentially at odds with the approach in proprietary stock cases. Um, talking about the question of the legal claim, my learned friend makes the point that one shouldn't have to have a, a trial within a trial. Um, and my Lord, Lord Justice Nugie said, well, isn't the point that we have to have the building blocks at least spelt out? Um, and in this morning, my learned friend referred to the possibility of a strikeout. If the claim was one that could be struck out, then I'm right in that it, it, it's potentially a case, that, or a situation that's not going to amount to detriment objectively. But how could anyone know if the case is one which could be struck out when no one has ever said what the claim is? No one has told the trial judge what the claim is. As I made the point uh, yesterday, it's not set out in the counterclaim what the nature of the claim is. It's not in the skeleton. It's not even said in closing submissions. The very first time my client knows what the claim that is supposed to have been made against, that, that Miss Hathaway could supposedly have made against him, the first time is in the judgment of the trial judge. It's the first time constructive trust is mentioned, or equity, I should say, in relation to that. It is not fair to him, because if he had known, he could have responded to it. And then there might have been a strikeout application. You might have been able to show this is not a cause of action known to the law, or the evidence simply is not there. So my point is not um, charting, uh, of course, through isolated islands. My point is about the burden of proof and how the claim has to be specified, because it is not fair to say, I have a claim. My learned friend tries to counter that by saying, we could have made a Part 18 request. What we did is, in our defense to the counterclaim, say there is no claim because they were not married. And that shows exactly how we interpreted the claim that was alleged to exist. The defendant had an opportunity to reply to that defense to counterclaim and could have said, no, no, you've misunderstood. We're not asserting a matrimonial claim. We're asserting something else. They did not do that. It's not for us to plead their case for them. And it's certainly, it is for them to tell the judge what their case is, what the claim is they've given up, not for a trial judge to speculate at the end of all the evidence, having heard no submission on the point, frankly, as to what that claim might be. Um, Robson and Ely is, was referred to this morning. It's a completely different case because the litigation, the potential claim in that case, was not a potential claim. It was extant litigation between the parties with an imminent trial date, costs having been incurred on both sides, and that trial date is then vacated and never relisted. That's clearly a situation where, there, where the court was, it was open to the court at least to find detriment. <coughs> it's very different to this situation where no one had ever brought a claim against anyone or even actually suggested a claim against anyone. Um, and finally, my, my, my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis, um, your Lordship said that isn't, isn't my learned friend's best point that it's an assignment of the shares rather than an agreement not to sue for the shares. Maybe that would have been a better point for my learned friend to make, but it's not how it's put. Paragraph 15.2 uh, asserts that the detriment suffered is that she desisted from making a claim, not she gave up her equitable interest in, in shares that she previously had. So that's how it's put. Can I just turn my back briefly to make sure I've covered the points mm -hmm. that I need to cover on? I, I, no, um, there is. My Lord, there is one additional point, and um, Lady Lady Justice Andrews raised it yesterday, and, and I thought it would be helpful for the court to hear from a family barrister who knows a bit more about these things and address the point 
from a, a matrimonial perspective. So I'll, I'll sit down for a moment and allow Miss Saunders to address you. Yes, Miss Saunders. What's the mystery point? <laughs> uh, well, my lord, I hope it's not a mystery point. Her ladyship raised a concern with us about how a party like Miss Hathaway, who was claiming reliance in a relationship where she has not contributed directly financially and could not use de detrimental reliance on the deal itself as a form of detriment, um, where she's doing nothing more than she'd already done in the past, for example, by looking after children, etc., could ever show detrimental reliance. Um, in fact, in uh, page 145 of the supplementary bundle, uh, in my skeleton argument at first instance... Hang on. One, four, five. Yes. Uh, paragraph 50. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we mentioned two cases, or I mentioned two cases in which the court has previously found, in addition to expenditure, other forms of behaviour as constituting sufficient detriment in order to justify relief being granted. So, for example, giving up career or educational opportunities. Um, and then, of course, in Davis and Davis, which I accept was a proprietary estoppel case, um, the point that the claimant positioned his whole life on the basis of the assurance given to him and reasonably, reasonably believed by him. Um, of course, in this case, um, my lord, the trial judge did consider a claim by Miss Hathaway in which she attempted to show that she had conducted her affairs on the basis of an expectation of receiving the equity and the property. This was the frugal living point. Yes, precisely. Um, so we would submit that the requirement of detrimental reliance in this context does not cause unfairness because it is sufficiently flexible to allow for circumstances where someone has relied on a common intention and irrevocably changed their position to their detriment. Uh, and indeed, my leader mentioned, of course, uh, farming cases in proprietary estoppel claims being the classic example of where that kind of detrimental reliance takes place. And so we submit detrimental reliance should be proven by the respondent in this case to justify the outcome that she seeks. Uh, and the reason I've been asked to speak to this point, of course, is because the outcome that she seeks is far more generous, we submit, than any matrimonial court would ever have been likely to allow. Of course, the party's financial circumstances in this case were not subject to the kind of full and frank disclosure that a financial remedy claim would insist upon. Um, but we do submit that it's highly unlikely that any court applying the factors under Section 25 of the Matrimonial Causes Act would ever have agreed to an order which gave all of the available capital to one of the parties, leaving the other reliance solely on share save schemes. So, we say that justifies the necessity for detrimental reliance in this case. I hope that answers um, your ladyship's point. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Um, before I leave ground three, there's the question of the amendment, whether that's being allowed. I think my learned friend has addressed all of the different yes, has. limbs under it, so I'm, I'm going to take it that he has actually extended his position of neutrality to, the, to, to all of the amendments, but of course he can't be prejudiced um, having seen them um, more than a month ago. And of course the, the additional points that my friend said he didn't agree with are just elaborations of the overarching of points that he does agree with. So, moving on to the other amendment, the more, much more recent amendment, and I appreciate your Lordship said yesterday the court was going to allow the amendment in principle of course, that was subject to seeing the text. Hmm. Um, so in my submission, I ought to um, have an opportunity to say a little bit about, um, about that in, in light of what we have now seen, but also um, having had a bit of more time to familiarize myself with the principles that apply on an amendment to bring a new claim that wasn't a new argument yeah. that wasn't per se to trial. Uh, and also, of course, the particular considerations that arise in the, the two big issues that now appear from this amendment, um, and to what extent they are pure points of law, to what extent they may be mixed questions of fact and law, to what extent additional evidence is um, potentially
potentially relevant. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that I wasn't able to address your lordships as, uh, and your ladyship as, as fully as I would have liked, given the exigencies of the, of the moment at 10.30 yesterday morning. Yeah, it's the Notting Hill finance case, isn't it, that tells us what to do? Sorry, sorry, my lord. The Notting Hill finance case that tells us what to do. Well, a, a lot of the um, authorities that are in this bundle, it's probably as thicker than it needs to be. I'm only going to take your lordship to a paragraph here and there um, in it. Uh, and I'm, I do apologise to my own friend for producing it um, so yeah. shortly before the hearing, but we're, we're all operating under constraints of time. Brent and Johnson, in my submission, is the last word on amendments to introduce new points on appeal. Yeah. I haven't found any additional learning on the situation here where it is sought to raise a new point on a second appeal or in the teeth of a considered concession, not just an off-the-cuff concession per incuriam, but what appears to be a deliberate concession, even if mistaken, to try and obtain some sort of uh, strategic example, uh, a benefit. Uh, in litigation. But what we would say about, about that is if it is right that to bring a second appeal as appellant, one needs to establish an important point of principle, then it must also be right to raise on a second appeal for the first time a new point of law that must also raise an important point of principle. Or some other compelling reason. Or some other compelling reason. And if it's right that this point raises an important point of principle, then it, I might suggest it needs a little bit more consideration than 10 hours of research, uh, what, one authority from a learned friend, um, and an hour and five minutes to deal with it in court. Because we're in the Court of Appeal, and your Lordship is entitled to expect um, uh, and, and benefit, I hope, from the uh, researches of counsel over a proper period of time. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so Brenton Johnson, paragraphs 37 to 39, mm -hmm. it's um, me. Perhaps six. I'm afraid quite a lot of these cases are your lordship. Um, but I, I know I'm not um, teaching your lordship anything new. Um, But at 38, the Lordship quotes from Singh and Das, a uh, decision of Lord Justice Haddon Cave. And these are the, the core principles. Firstly, that the court must be cautious about allowing a new point to be raised on appeal that was not raised before the first instance falls. Secondly, an appellate court will not generally permit a new point to be raised if that point is such that either it would necessitate new evidence or had it been run below, it would have resulted in the trial being run differently. And thirdly, even if it is a pure point of law, so it doesn't fall into um, the excluded points under, under limb two, there are three conditions that have to be met. First, there has to be adequate time. Second, no one must have ad acted to their detriment uh, in reliance uh, on the um, point not having been made previously. And thirdly, can the other party be compensated or protected in costs? Paragraph 39 is where it is pointed out that there's a spectrum of cases, or Justice Snowden pointed out there's a spectrum of cases uh, rather than a bright dividing line. Paragraphs 40 and 41, a quotation of the early decision of Prudential, which with perhaps echoes of the, is it Faye, the case about Greek yogurt um, and the, uh, the dress rehearsal. Um, I, I was just, I was being educated on how to pronounce the name of the party in that case. I always thought it was Phage, but anyway. Oh, well. <laughs> there we are. We'll go with Phage. It's, it's easier, isn't it? Um, paragraph 45 makes the point that it's clear from the skeleton argument that the point would have to be made, further findings of fact would need to be made, so that's one of the examples. Um, paragraph 46, um, the council makes the point that the, sub the, 
the admit of disclosure might have been different or would have been different. Further investigation into and evidence about how and from where the funds were procured would have been necessary. And 47 is important, my Lord. Um, it is not usually profitable for the appeal court to speculate as to what other questions might have been asked of those who could give evidence, or what other evidence might have been asked from other witnesses, or by way of other documents, if it had been made clear before the evidence was called that the point now sought to be relied on was a plank in the defence. Um, so those are familiar principles, or at least familiar now to me. Um, Behind tab four is a decision of Mr. John Baldwin, QC, as he then was um, in a case called Bardwaj and RBS. And the reason I refer to that is because it's a case on permission being needed to take a point for the first time on appeal about section two of the 1989 Act, obviously analogous to section 53, um, and also taking a point on certainty on, a, on, on appeal where the point had been abandoned at trial. So there are similarities with this case, uh, and if, but of course it's a first appeal, not a second appeal. Uh, paragraph 20, we see that the certainty point had been judged fine. Sorry, paragraph 22. 20. 20. Um, is where uh, yeah. the learned deputy judge says that the certainty point was abandoned. Paragraphs 22 and 23 say the same principles apply here in the High Court as opposed to the Court of Appeal. And paragraph uh, 23 makes the point that there's been no explanation as to why there's been a change of mind about this certainty point. And then his Lordship says this would need new evidence and a new trial and so he refuses it. And paragraph 45... Sorry, where does he say new evidence, new trial? Um, well, in, in the following paragraphs. Um, in 21? No, sorry, I was just trying to be, be quick. Paragraph 23 is where it says no explanation. Um, and Mr. Hartman, at paragraph 24, submits that no evidence was needed to resolve the point. Right, yes, I see. Because Nestor Chuck disagrees, um, and the point is resolved. Right, so there's an argument about whether... And at paragraph 29, Miss Nestor Chuck um, refers to your Lordship's publication about... Um, Certainty mm. and the but the point I really wanted to come on to is, is the is the section two point, which is paragraph forty five, page seventy four of the little bundle. Yeah. Um, it, this is a point which was not argued before before the judge judge died of permission um, to raise the matter for the first time, and it was not sought before as it was Mr Justice Nugy, um, as your Lordship then was. And Mr Hartman contends it's a pure point of law, and you should be permitted to raise it on this appeal. And in the following paragraphs, Miss Nestor has a lot of answers to all of the uh, um, attempts that Mr Ng has to escape from the uh, argument that further evidence may be needed, yes. and the result is that Mr. Uh, Mr. Baldwin says that he's satisfied if he were to permit the appellants to run the section two point, the immediate consequence would be to have to remit the case to the court below, give case management direction. Where, where are you now? Sorry, page, page 59. Yes, 59. 59. Yeah. Conclusion. Sorry, I'm going too fast and tripping myself up. And that was the only reason that he refused it. Um, he didn't refuse it because it had been abandoned. It's certainly a factor that he, he takes his... He took it into account, into but account. that's not the ratio. The ratio is, um, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to allow this amendment, having heard the argument on it, because I'm satisfied that it would require further fact-finding. And therefore, I, therefore, it wouldn't be appropriate. So the fact that it was, it was deliberately abandoned is not a factor that he ultimately made a difference. Yes. But it, 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 in my submission, it is at least a factor. It's a, it's a um, what, what I really say about this case is that Section 53 will have many of the same considerations of fact that were found to be pertinent in this case in relation to Section 2. Crane and Sky, um, I think that's tab one in my bundle, mm. 
uh, is a slightly older case on the same point, but it seems to have become a bit of a parallel line of authorities, um, just, uh, and is not referred to in the um, in the uh, case we just looked at, despite it being a very um, powerful constitution of this court. And the Jones and MBNA case, which is quoted in paragraph 18, is, is not cited in those other cases. So I just wanted to ask your lordship to read uh, paragraph 18 and the quotation from Jones and MBNA, and, and I've highlighted the particular yeah. key passages. to litigation are entitled to know where they stand. The parties are entitled and the court requires to know what the issues are. Over the page we have the classic quotation from Lord Herschel that points such as this ought to be most jealously scrutinised. That's the same thing as saying ought to be cautious of the flowery language. Yeah. If we go to 22 and 23, it's where Lady Justice Arden comes to her conclusion principle that permission to raise a new point should not be given lightly is likely to find every case, save where the point of law, which doesn't involve further evidence, and which involves little variation in the case which the party has already had to meet, to reverse to fatality and grant. And then she says at 23, new ground of appeal will require further factual findings on areas not yes. covered by judgment. But I do, I, but that's, that's a slightly truncated description of what fatality and grant says, Fatalis and Grant feeds directly into Singh and Das, which feeds directly into Yeah, and Fatalis was actually all about the court's jurisdiction, which is another yes, good I had reason a, for giving I, I wasted quite a lot of time reading that one, um, and the permutations of the County Court Act yeah. over time. Um, and I wondered if there was a, a point to be made about Section 80 of the County Court Act 1984, given that this case started in the County Court, yeah. and whether the, whether the um, trial judge ought to have been asked to make a note of his of his finding on the law on the point that was never argued in front of him. Um, but of course, that uh, uh, decided against that. Um, but finally, my lord, um, Dimitri and Mapara, which is very recent, which is tab eight, seven. Oh dear, it's me again. I'm afraid so. Um, but it's it's relevant because it concerns a series of deeds granting burial rights to the then trustees of the Tottenham Park Islamic Cemetery Association. The subject is useful, or the subject matter is useful because it deals with a written document, a deed, and, it, and the new ground of appeal sought to deal with the juridical nature of an exclusive right of burial. And at paragraph 9, your lordship deals with the application to amend. Yeah. At paragraph 14, is the paragraph I've highlighted. Yes. <coughs> and your Lordship summarises at the end of that paragraph the Sing and Das criteria, the Partisan Grant criteria. Yes. And there are echoes there of the authorities on very late amendments of pleadings. Well, that's because it was in substance an application to appeal out of time. Yeah, and whereas this is this one is not. This is an upholding the judge's order for different reasons. But there is surely a close analogy with applications for very late amendment of pleadings, um, mm -hmm. as in the Swain, Mason, and Mills and Reeve case, which is a case I still bear the psychological scars of eleven years later, yeah. when this court. Um, held that a party was, was entitled not to be mucked about, yes, adopting the, the words from worldwide. Uh, that was an where there was an attempt to amend on the first day of trial, which would have necessitated an adjournment, and it was refused on appeal. So the situation must be even more exceptional to justify an amendment of the pleaded case or, or to the um, arguments that have been raised 
after the evidence, after submissions, after judgment, after even the first appeal, making all that's gone before irrelevant at the point of his arrival. And finally, there's Nesbitt. Sorry, Nesbitt. Nesbitt, yes, which is. Where is Nesbitt? Thank you. Nesbitt is tab five. Tab five. We've got a decision <coughs> of Sir Geoffrey yeah. Voss, the Chancellor, Lady Justice Sharp, and Lord Justice Hamlin in 2018. Um, so it's paragraphs 40 to 45. The, and 41 in particular. In essence, the court must, taking account of the overriding objective balance and justice of the party seeking to amend it, it has refused permission against the need for finality in litigation, the injustice to the other parties and other litigants, if the amendment is permitted, is a heavy burden on the party seeking a late amendment to justify the lateness of its application and show the strength of the new case and why justice requires him to be able to pursue it. These principles apply with even greater rigour to an amendment made after trial and in the course of an appeal. So, my lord, if I can persuade your lordship that there is any evidential question arising, then the amendment should be refused and that's the end of it. Because the trial and the case management leading up to it would have been run differently. And if I can't, if it is pure law, your lordship should grant permission only if persuaded that my learned junior and I and I have had enough time to deal with it in the last ten waking hours. And, and I say that means, at least when we're in this court, that that means we could give as good an account of our submissions on the law as we would have been able to give at trial, or on the first appeal, or on the second appeal if it had been raised before, when we would have had weeks to think about these points and formulate submissions. As to the second limb, of the, well, the, se the second part of the third limb of Singh and Das detriment, it's not entirely clear what is meant. And when we go back to Vitalis and Grant, it's not elaborated on. It can't mean not having a chance to put in evidence, because, of course, that's limb two. Uh, and, it, and, and then it wouldn't be a pure question of law. It can't mean not having enough time to prepare, because that would be part one of limb three. And it can't mean incurring a legal cost, because that would be part three of, of, of limb three. And, and I don't suggest, of course, that there's any close analogy with detriment in the constructive trust of the proprietary estoppel case. But in my submission, the use of that word is akin to the dicta in Worldwide and Swain Mason about being mucked about. And in my submission, the court can look at the effect of the litigation, which might, might prove to be wholly unnecessary and pointless litigation if that new case raised by amendment were to be a good one. What effect it has had on the parties to it in the widest sense. First of all, in litigation, there may have been negotiations between parties. There may have been mediation or other opportunities for settlement passed up on the perceived strength of the party's positions as they had been argued and were being argued. And that cannot be easily compensated in costs. And secondly, related to the idea that there may have been opportunities to end the litigation sooner, there may be implications, uh, if you're commercial parties, that the litigation could have a stifling effect on one's business. Uh, for example, in exploiting a trademark or something of that nature. If they are domestic parties, and the litigation is between family members, then it could include an effect on the family. So those are the authorities. How are they to be applied here, my lord? First, there are two big issues raised by the amendments. The first is whether this email, or these se the sequence of emails, is something within the ambit of section 53, or within the ambit of section 2. If the latter, then it is conceded, it's still conceded, that it does not comply with the more stringent formalities of Section 2. Yeah. The second big issue is if whether it is caught by 53, if it's within the ambit of 53, whether the name at the bottom of some of the emails is a valid signature within the meaning of Section 53. As to the first issue on the law set out in Roller Team and Riley, that's paragraphs 37 and 38 of the um, third tab. <coughs> 37 and 
37 and 38. Paragraphs, so it's paragraph, page 55 of the Bannon Affairs. Yep. This is um, Lord Justice Henderson <coughs> reviewing the authorities. Yes. Lord, Lord can um, skim read those two paragraphs. The decision being made is that Section 2 covers an executory contract for, the, for a future disposition of an interest in land, whereas a contract which includes an immediate disposition is within Section 53. But it must be one or the other. It can't be both. And that's why, as I mentioned, the express concession that it is, that is a Section 2 contract needs to be withdrawn if this amendment is going to get off its feet. Maybe it's been withdrawn by implication. And although this is a decision of the Court of Appeal, it is a hard one to get one's head around, if I may say so. And it's not without controversy as a matter of precedent. Not only is it building on a great deal of legal history, um, it is also, as Lord Justice Henderson acknowledges at paragraphs 40 to 42, disapproving, in effect, another decision of this court the decision of Lady Justice Arden, as she then was, in Joyce and Rigoli, or at least distinguishing it in, in a somewhat critical manner. What, one might ask, is the policy reason for imposing more stringent formality requirements on contracts to dispose of an interest in land in the future, as opposed to a contract to dispose of an interest in land right now? That distinction makes little sense in my submission, uh, and surely that policy consideration ought to affect how the court interprets. I don't find that difficult at all. The contract is of its very nature a bilateral document, a two party exchange thing. The disposition of a unilateral it's a disposition by the owner of property, you can do it on a, under his own signature. I don't find it at all surprising that only the signature of the disponer, if he is actually disposing of property, should you need the signature of both. I'm, I'm not saying that the distinction cannot be drawn. I'm saying it's difficult to see why, if I contract with my learned friend to give him my house to, next week, it has to comply with certain formalities. But if I contract, well, only, only, only if you're extracting a promise of retirement. Well, that would that would suggest that a contract, that a bilateral contract for an immediate disposition of an interest in land would not would be outside. But, but the contract. formalities are different. I mean the. Hmm. For the executory contract, you need to set one piece of paper signed by both, or an exchange, yes. as that expression has been interpreted. You don't need either in um, a disposition. No, and I, in my submission, that's curious. Well, there it, it is. That's what the law says. I, I, I agree. Um, I, 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 well. Lady Justice Arden in the Herbert and Doyle case, which was referred to in the Ely and Roberts Robson case, I noticed, talks about the policy of Section 2 being to prevent the public, or to protect the public by preventing parties from being bound by a contract for the disposition of an interest in land unless it is being fully documented in writing. And that suggests that under both provisions, the court should not be quick to find that the parties have bound themselves uh, in matters of land by angry exchanges of emails. So as a matter of submission on the law, my lord, this is not straightforward. I can do the best I can, but I certainly don't feel uh, that I've had a chance to formulate a, a, a legal argument and identify all the authorities on the point that might bear on it. So on that question of law alone in my submission, we don't meet condition one of the third limb of sin. But it's not just a question of law, is it? It's about interpreting these emails, yes, to see whether they should be interpreted as a section two, a future disposition of land, or a contract for the future disposition of land, or section 53, an immediate disposition of land. First, we must have a full run of these emails. Sorry, say that again? We must have at least a full run of these emails in order to interpret them in their context. Just because my learned friend says we rely on these two emails doesn't exclude from the court. Um, consideration, all the other emails in the sequence. 
Um, and we don't have all the emails. We don't believe we have all the emails, not just because it's not in the appeal bundle. Now, we've put together a clip of correspondence. I don't want to take your lordship to it now. But and, and indeed, a spreadsheet was prepared at the time to demonstrate gaps that, there, that we perceived there were in the email correspondence. And there were um, points made about emails no longer being available. And there may also, of course, have been text messages or WhatsApp messages between the parties. Now, your lordship may say to me, well, yes, but you would have wanted a full run of correspondence in order to develop your case about the timing of the sale of the property or the oil spill, for example. And my answer to, be, would, would, to, to that would be to say, well, that was our argument, which we had to make good, that we had set out, and we were in a position to decide what we needed to make it good. The decision was taken that we didn't need to press for any further uh, correspondence. And we failed, as it turned out, on, on that argument. But that was our risk to take. That's not the same situation as where the other side has raised a point um, about which we might have been very worried and which would have given us grounds to press harder for disclosure than we did. Who knows what would have come out? This court can't know, and this court shouldn't speculate. Secondly, what if there were contractual oral pronouncements? The parties were speaking to each other. We see that from the top of page um, 46 in the supplementary bundle, where Miss Hudson says, in terms, just hold on there, this halfway, sorry, 46. Yes, supplementary bundle 46, she says, anyway, sorry you are so angry about it all. It felt like we were able to hold something approaching a civil conversation last week. Must have imagined that. So they, ha they were talking to each other, as well as communicating with each other by email. And I know the, the learned judge said, well, I can decide this on the emails. But it's a different point that he was considering. Well, how can the fact that they had a conversation three weeks earlier help on the construction of the document? It becomes. Let's say there might be documents that are not just emails. There may be WhatsApps. There may be texts. Um, there are there. Well, I'm going to, going to come on to the various ways in which subjective intention of the parties can, to some extent, influence the interpretation. I'll do that very briefly because, well, for obvious reasons. Um, It is possible, is it not, that those conversations, had been an issue, would have been put in evidence, and one of the parties would have met, would have said something to the other that made it clear that what they were intending was a future, was a future disposition as opposed to an immediate disposition, or vice versa. That assumes that three weeks earlier, when they were having the conversation, he intended to send this angry email. I'm not saying I'm not saying that one week earlier, or whenever it was, it's, that was the conversation. No, but. It, it's a bit of a far stretch, isn't it? Really. There, and, but there is a respectable argument, in my submission. These emails, being as uh, was emphasised yesterday, emails between lay people without legal advice, are in need of subjective evidence of intention to properly interpret them. What does a lay person mean by the equity in the house when the immediately previous email he had said the proceeds of sale? Do they mean the same thing? These are potentially ambiguous terms in context. And as your Lordship's book says at paragraph 830, whether evidence of a party's subjective intention is admissible to resolve latent ambiguities remains to be resolved. And there was some evidence and some cross-examination cross -examination about these emails. So both parties were pre um, proceeding on the assumption that there was something potentially to be said um, more than the words of the emails themselves, but directed to an entirely different issue. Whether the beneficial interest was going to transfer now or later. Fourthly, there may be um, interpretation points about a couple's private dictionary. When What, what does a layperson mean by equity in the house, as I say? Um, and that's a, a pretty classic example for admitting that sort of evidence. And even if I'm wrong about it, 
that all that, and there's no no chance of any of that being relevant, even on a wholly objective approach to interpreting a contract or a disposition, one must still interpret them in the light of the whole factual matrix pertaining at the time, and that's contractual interpretation number 101. But what did the factual matrix consist of in this case? We have some fine, a few findings about where the parties stood in relation to each other in 2003, but it's very patchy when one looks at the judgment. And your lordship cannot say now, my learned friend cannot say now, that all the findings of the judgment, uh, or those findings are all the findings the trial judge could have made on the issue if the, interpret if the issue had been a different one about the timing of the assignment of the beneficial interest. Where were the parties in relation to their mortgage obligations? What, in fact, could they afford to pay going forward? And, in fact, a point my learned friend made yesterday a couple of times actually provides a very neat example of why the factual matrix is important. He said, look at the email on page 45. Bring it, put it away again. 45 of the supplementary bundle. Look at the fact that it refers to the will of Mr. Hudson. As for a will, if I were to die before this financial mess is sorted, Heidi will have no right to picnic house. And my only friend relied on that to say that he must have meant an immediate assignment because he told Miss Hathaway that under his will his wife would have no right to the house. Under his will, not under his intestacy. He doesn't say, however, Heidi would have no rights under my will because it's all yours already. He might have meant Heidi will have no rights to the house on my death because my will will leave my property to my children, my sons, our sons. <coughs> what Mr. Hudson's testamentary dispositions were at the time this email was sent is a critical bit of the factual matrix on my learned friend's own case. That wasn't in evidence. No one had sought disclosure of wills. One cannot now speculate what might have come out if they had, and what difference it might have made. And finally, even if it is just a question of interpreting the sequence of emails in isolation, two points remain. First, irrespective of the evidence, the case would have been run in a different way at trial. The issues at trial were about whether time for sale of the property was a condition and whether it was a term that Mr. Hudson would be allowed to buy the property at a discount. And the judge found against us on that. But if my client and, and his advisors at the time had appreciated that the first and foremost issue was whether these emails had effected immediate dis an immediate disposition of an interest in land, then Malona Jr. may well have taken a different approach at trial. And further, the judge's findings, which are understandably equivocal, as far as the question of immediacy goes, would have been different and would have been on point. And wouldn't be here now. That's the first point, even if it's just a question of interpreting the emails in isolation. The second point is that it's still a very involved argument. What is part of the pre-contractual negotiations and therefore excluded as to what might be part of the documents forming part of the same transaction? And therefore admissible, or evidence forming part of the same part of the matrix of fact, and therefore admissible. These points are not easy ones, and frankly, it can't be done to the standard this court is entitled to expect in half a day after too little sleep, and it can't be done in a way that does justice to my client. That's just the first of the two big issues raised by the amendment. The second big issue is when a name at the bottom of an email is a good signature for Section 53. And I could do no better in that than to refer your Lordship to the passage on this in Emmett and Farron, which is in my extra bundle. That's tab eight, page one, two, four onwards. It's quite a 
long passage. Uh, and that in itself tells you much of what you need to know. That there is still actually a lot of scope for argument about electronic signatures generally. The case which was identified, my own friend referred to Ocean, um, perhaps say Ocean Palestine, Palestine lives not called that. Um, Ocean Ocean and Saga. Thank you. The uh, email that had the name Guy at the bottom of it, that was a decision of this court lasting three days with four notable silks appearing to decide whether those emails were binding or not. All sorts of questions of law remain. What is the point of the Electronic Communications Act 2000 if the law is already that any old name at the bottom of an email will do? How, frankly, does someone typing a name at the bottom of an email remotely help to authenticate a document in the same way that a wet ink signature, which cannot easily be forged, um, does? Does it matter if the name is part of an automatic signature added by the server rather than by the conscious decision of the user? The case of Nucleus and Reese says that an auto-generated email footer can count as a signature, but that's only first instance authority, not binding on this court. It, it's, a, it's a large in this court, and as your Lord, you've observed, the one case in this court preceded by concession on that key point. Why did the Law Commission find just three years ago that uncertainty remained about the legal effect of electronic signatures and that statutory reform was therefore desirable? Why is it, if it's now clear that a type signature will do, that there has yet to be any case in this jurisdiction where anyone has attempted to admit an electronic will to probate? Secondly, what comes out of the discussion in Emerson Farrand is a particular area for argument whether a signature uh, was in the particular circumstances applied with an authenticating intent. And that reference to intent suggests, doesn't it, that there is at least scope for the admission of circumstantial extrinsic evidence as to what the party's intent was, such as evidence of their usual practice or their email program settings, maybe also as to the wholly subjective intention of the sender in an unclear case, when appending or failing to disappend their signature at the bottom of a, an email. Well, that's well, not this case at all. Well, is it, isn't it, my lord? Well, the, the particular emails that are, are relied on, I mean, particularly the one of the 31st of July, which was forwarded to uh, Miss Hathaway, uh, was, let find it. It has the name Lee at the bottom. It has the name Lee at the bottom, exactly so. I've the wrong bundle here. Um, I accept that. I accept that, but... I'll, I'll just come on to say a few words about that in a moment. The third point that comes out Sorry, of the Sorry, just, just a minute. Sorry. Yes, it says Lee at the bottom. There are certainly, there are emails which look as though they have uh, an automatically inserted subscription. Yes. Um, where it says um, Lee Hudson, branch manager, or whatever it was, his Cox. But this one doesn't. This one has his, he has plainly subscribed his name. Well, my lord, I'm going to respectfully suggest that that is, a, that is speculation about what the evidence might be. Because, um, it, well, let me, let me come on to it one moment, because I'm going to preface what my points on that with this observation. But your lordships may notice, you may have, when, when I know there are, there are a lot of cases, as my lady uh, said a moment ago, that every single case, in which an electronic signature has been found to suffice, every one has been a commercial case. Mm -hmm. In no case that we have found, and various people sitting behind me have found, has a private domestic consumer been held to have been bound by a mere name at the bottom of an email. Not one. We have looked. The Golden Ocean case itself makes clear that the commercial context, the fact that the email is being sent in the course of business by an employee, was important to the decision. So there is scope for major argument as to whether the same presumptions and principles apply to informal communications between lay people as apply between business people in commercial contexts. There's some very old cases on guarantees that include uh, a case in which um, a signature by your affectionate mother was held to be enough. 
although it was in writing and not electronic, that it was in the 19th century? Yes. Yes, we would have to look not only at the modern cases on electronic signatures, but also at old cases on what sorts of wet signatures will do. Thumbprints. What I'm saying is that there are, there are signatures outside of the commercial context where um, slightly less formal signatures have been held. But there's signatures. been a conscious decision to write that. And the question is, is there an authenticating intent? Yes, that's, that's the, the, the acid test. That, that runs right through all these authorities is whether the um, whatever has been appended by somebody to the document, whether it be at the bottom or the top, is intended to authenticate that as emanating from them and binding them. That's what it. That's what it all amounts to, and that I think is what the most recent authority, the um, uh, Neoclius and Rees, yes. uh, in in 2019 says, uh, the one um, case that sort of sticks out like a sore thumb is First Post and Johnson, which was very, very strongly criticised by the Law Commission, but is still a decision of this court. So given that there are references to the need for authenticating intent, and my point is that in the domestic sphere, how do you decide if someone intends an email signature to authenticate or not? There is no learning on it. At the moment. Can we try and tease out what the point is? Because I've not understood what the difficulty is. No. Leave aside electronic signatures. If one proceeds on the basis that Mr. Hudson typed his name, what other purpose could there be for putting his name at the bottom of the email other than to indicate the email is coming from him? And what does it mean to say you have an authenticating intent other than to say my intention in putting my name in this? Is so that the recipient knows it comes from me. I mean, I haven't quite understood. Yeah, I, understand. I was going to come. That was my Lord Lord Justice Lewison's question, and I was coming to it. Right. So, in the um, commercials, even in the commercial sphere, there is likely to have been evidence in these cases that have been decided about what the settings on people's devices were. But it is purely happenstance especially in the domestic context, whether a particular communication is by text message or by email, would a text message with a signature name at the bottom count? It's pure happenstance whether an email is sent from someone's iPhone or from their computer. Well, you, you may well be able to postulate all sorts of questions which might arise in a different case. Well, I, for example, if I send an email from my personal Gmail account on my iPhone. My iPhone is set up to add my name at the bottom of it. If I send it through the same email account from my laptop, it's not set up like that, and it won't have my name at the bottom of it. Well, there may be a question if, if the name is automatically inserted, but that's not this case. Well, how does your lordship know with respect? Because he may have sent some emails from his iPhone with the word that automatically puts Lee at the bottom. He may have sent some of his emails from his work computer, which adds different signature. And he may have sent it from something that says nothing at all, and he would have to add it manually. We just don't know. And that is some evidence which would have been necessary to adduce at trial. And the facts of this case illustrate the difficulty of this submission. In formal correspondence between two people, one person might put their name at the bottom as a matter of habit or manners. And the other person, as a matter of habit, doesn't. And in fact, we see that Jane very often doesn't have her name at the bottom of emails. But the manner and intention of the conversation going on, the representations of that in that conversation, are the same for each party. Can it really be the case that one party to that email conversation is bound because they happen to have their, um, they happen to put their name at the bottom of it, either deliberately or automatically, where the other person is not? Well, Can yes, it really it be the authenticates the document? If, if if whatever happens to be on the on the document suffices to authenticate that as being their signature, then yes, they're bound by it, irrespective of whether the other party has put their name on the document or not. Well, that is certainly that is certainly an argument. I uh, but in my submission, it is that it, it it could produce very strange results if you have two parties, two contracting parties in a domestic context, one of whom regularly puts Lee at the bottom and the other, the other of whom never puts Jane at the bottom. 
um, can it really be the case that one party is at risk of disposing of an equitable interest in something the other is not? And so it's small wonder the Law Commission says it's unsatisfactory and that we need legislative reform because the formalities we are talking about are required to protect parties from accidentally disposing of land. I thought the Law Commission decided that no change in the law was necessary. Well, we can see the um, quotation from the... in the... Um, in, in Emerson Farrand. It said it's not clear. I'm um, thank you very much. One two seven. Their uh, consultation. Yes. So, so we consider legislative reform is not necessary. Ah, but read on, my lord. Uh, that's the, the consultation question. Do, do the consultees agree? Although a majority of consultees yeah. did agree in their final report, the law commissioners were persuaded that uncertainty remained about the legal effect of electronic signatures, and leaving non-lawyers and small businesses to search through case law is arguably undesirable, given the importance and pervasiveness. They didn't them. make a re recommendation, but they offered an option for reform by codification. And the Law Society then has, has issued a practice note. Yeah. Yes. So that question as to is potentially an evidential one as to how that name appears at the bottom of those emails. But there's no evidence as to whether Mr. Hudson had an automatic signature set up on some or all or none of his devices. And insofar as this is a pure question of law, it is a vexed one with respect. This court would be making entirely new law in the domestic consumer context. And I suggest it may not be a good idea to do that in this case without the benefit of proper considered research and submissions. We haven't had enough time. My only friend certainly hasn't had enough time. He provided just the single authority, which is actually on a different point. Uh, uh, and, and insofar as it's on this point, it proceeded by concessions. Um, that's the sum total of the research and submission which we now propo propose to address to, to to this court at ten to four on a on a uh, in the afternoon. So on both those issues, therefore, I've addressed question B of Singh in terms of the evidence. We say there are factual inquiries that could have been made, and they might well have made a difference. This court should be cautious and should not speculate. And I've addressed question C1, third limb, first part, as to whether we've had enough time, even if these are pure points of law, and we say, no, we haven't. And again, your lordship should be cautious before bouncing parties into making difficult submissions and, and making important rulings on new areas of law without the quality of research submissions needed. What of the second part, detriments? My clients will have been thoroughly mucked about if a new point is allowed in now. This litigation has been on foot for three years. It has blighted his life, Miss Hathaway's life too for that matter. There was a mediation, there was a mediation which was unsuccessful and I can say no more about it than that. There have been, without prejudice or without prejudice, save as to costs offers on both sides and I can say no more about those than that. So there really is a sense in which allowing this point to be taken at this 11th hour and 59th minute will have caused real detriment to both parties, having negotiated with each other on a false basis. And what of the more personal effect on Mr. Hudson? I say this, of course, on instructions rather than on evidence, but what else can I do in the circumstances? This litigation has had a terrible effect on him, personally and emotionally. His sons have sided with their mother, Miss Hathaway. He no longer has a real relationship with them, which is devastating for him. His first grandchild was born not very long ago, and he's never met this first grandchild. Because of this litigation, he has been very keen to settle his case so as to put himself in a position to mend these relationships. If this point had been taken sooner, his legal team would have had a chance to advise him on the point, and he could have made a proper, con uh, a proper considered decision as to how to proceed. If my client has endured three years of misery, not just costs, because of my learned friend's failure to spot the point sooner, then that is real detriment to him, falling within that limb of Singh and Das.
Well, those are my submissions on whether this um, appeal, new point on appeal, should be, be allowed. allowed. Yes. To proceed. Um, in view of the time, I wonder whether your lordship wishes to make a decision on that, and um, and then potentially hear further submissions on the on the full substance of it. Or whether we, we proceed and see what we can do in 20 minutes. I think we proceed, see what you can do in 20 minutes, we'll reach a final decision in our judgments. Um, and um, if you want some time to put in some written submissions, we will be sympathetic. That's understood. I'm not grateful for that invitation. On the interpretation of the emails, then, on a subject on a purely objective basis, assuming there's nothing else that could have been said in evidence or further disclosure that would bear on those, the interpretation of those emails, I'll ask my own friend, Ms. Saunders, to address you on that question. As I am slightly more familiar with the emails than my own leader, I'm going to deal with this point, if I may. Um, in order for the court to consider whether the two emails that my learned friends rely on at 45 and 46 of the supplementary bundle amount to a disposition, you will need to reach the conclusion that it is possible simply objectively to ascertain from the emails alone uh, the necessary elements under section 53, subsection 1. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm not going to try and take you through this in any kind of detail. Um, but it's trite law that in order for there to be an equitable assignment, there must be certainty of the intention to assign, certainty as regards the shows or thing in action that's the subject of the assignment, and certainty as regards the identity of the assignee. I, I would submit that in this case, broadly, the key issue is whether the court can find certainty as to the intention to, dis to assign, and that the emails were intended to be an immediate disposition. Um, my learned leader has referred briefly to the point about future versus immediate disposition. Um, I don't have time to take you through that in any more detail. Um, but in my submission, it is important for your lordships and your ladyship to note that there are two real caveats to this. The first, as foreshadowed in the existing papers, is that we have not been provided with a full run of emails between the parties. If these two emails are sufficient, then that's one thing. But in my submission, the court has to consider the emails in their broader context. Um, at trial, there was so a just, separate... Just, just pause a moment. Can you haven't been provided with a full run of emails. No. The emails are emails, as I understanding, understand it, passing between Mr Hudson and Ms Hathaway. Yes, my lord. So it, why do you not have because the record of that two-way traffic, either in sent items or received items. Because Both. my client no longer works for Hiscox Insurers. I see. At the time of trial, he had no access to the email account to which the vast majority of these emails were sent and from which the vast majority of the emails were sent. Although, as my learned leader has already uh, submitted, we didn't, in fact, have any evidence about what was sent from where and how and why it was that the signatures on various different emails were different. That simply wasn't raised yeah. as an issue. But my client had no access to them. Right. Um, in brief, there were real issues in disclosure about what was missing. There are references in the email to oral conversations. None of that was dealt with in the evidence, but I will do my best with what I have if I can. Um, we would submit that, in fact, a proper reading of the emails, the specific wording of the emails, is that this was a proposal for a future disposition. A and I would pause there to note that is how it has always been argued, mm. even by my learned friend, Mr. Halton, when he stood before you to start his argument on this amendment, offer and acceptance of future receipt of sale proceeds. Um, I, I would ask your Lordship, when looking at your objective assessment of this, just to consider very briefly the context set out by His Honour, His Honour Judge Ralton in his judgment, 
Um, I'll just give you the page number without referring you to those paragraphs specifically in light of the time. But at, from paragraph 17 to 32 of his judgment, which you'll find in the core bundle starting at 191, he sets out in brief, as he saw it at that time, based on the arguments that he heard, of course, the relevant background between the parties. But a lot of the difficulty, of course, was due to the difficulty in selling the property as a result of contamination yes. through heating oil. Um, when looking at the context, in my submission, it's important to consider on the balance of probabilities whether my client would, in fact, have intended to part with the asset immediately while it was clear that he was going to remain liable under the mortgage. It is very clear from the context of the emails that Miss Hathaway was not able to release him from the mortgage without selling the property. It was also very clear in my submission from the emails that sale of this property was not going to be quick or easy. Um, and although in the emails my client accepts that he will um, pay an ongoing contribution, in my submission there's a real difference between an ongoing voluntary contribution and ongoing responsibility or financial obligation. If I have time, and I'm very conscious that perhaps I don't, in the subsequent emails, it is very clear, I would submit, that Miss Hathaway, between 2013 and 2015, considers that Mr Hudson has an ongoing responsibility or obligation towards the property. There are numerous emails in which she refers explicitly to his obligations to her, but also to the property and the financial responsibility she says that he has for continuing, for example, to pay the interest only mortgage, which, for which he is still jointly and severally liable, even if your lordships and your ladyship find that he has parted with his equitable interest, as indeed the judge did. Um, I would submit, however, that a proper reading of these emails demonstrates the futurity of the intention. Um, if I can take you to the specific wording, and I will be brief in this, but I think it's important. Um, halfway down the page 45, we have the paragraph which is oft quoted um, but I would submit is worth rereading in the context of this point about immediate disposition. The house, a bad asset which is preventing all of us from moving on with our lives. You can't afford it, pausing there. He knows full well he's going to remain on the hook of the mortgage because Miss Hathaway can't by herself pay for the property, not even on the interest only mortgage. So the sooner it is sold, the better all round. He then goes on, you know what I want. Sorry, you know what? I want none of the proceeds of that either. Pausing there, he's talking about the proceeds, I would submit, the proceeds of sale. He says, take it, buy yourself somewhere you can afford to live. So it's clear that what he is talking about is the proceeds of sale of the property. Um, you'll probably be able to do so mortgage-free. There's then the reference to the will. My learned leader's already dealt with the factual difficulties in relation to that, so I won't um, cover that point. Skipping on a paragraph, what he says there is, what I want is an end to it. So have everything that's available to have now and when the house is sold. The long-term future stuff, the who knows how it will pan out stuff, my pension and my shares are mine. I don't want you hanging around for years to come with your handout. Um, so give me my dividend check, etc. And yeah. his name is at the bottom of the email. Um, I would submit that he is talking about Miss Hathaway receiving the proceeds of sale when the house is sold. Not now, not I give you my interest in the property. He's saying, we sell the house, the mortgage is gone, you can't afford it, 
you can have it when we've sold it. That, in my submission, is how that email can properly be interpreted as it stands alone. Moving on, um, the chain of correspondence, I'll skip, if I may, the 31st of July email from Ms. Hathaway that you have at the top yeah. of page 46, because I would submit it doesn't assist us. You then have Ms. Hathaway's response on the 12th of August. And the, the second email that my learned friends rely on, on the 9th of September. My first submission on this point, my lord, is that you cannot read the 9th of September email at 12.59 from my client without reading the email above it. The two make no sense without each other. Um, you have to be prepared to incorporate, I would submit, the email from Miss Hathaway above, which I note does not apparently have her name attached. Although, of course, as with a lot of these emails, you will see at the bottom, above the line, there is a quoted text hidden mm. bracket. Now, we assume, as that's all that we can do based on a reading of these emails, that all that is hidden there is the chain of email correspondence. But again, my lord, there was no evidence about that. Um, Lord, well, I've got but, the original email with me in court. Um, nothing has been taken out well, other than the original chain. Just to anticipate this point, I've got my client to send my shopping solicitor to the original email, so we didn't have any arguments about this point. And if there had been any issue about it, I would have drawn it to your logic then. Well, uh, of course, I entirely accept my learned friend's word on this, but to be told that at mm. this very late stage <laughs> in the day um, is, in my submission, rather unsatisfactory. But Again, doing the best I can with what we have. Um, my Lords, my Lady, I would ask you to read the email at 12.10, which I would submit needs to be included if you're going to consider whether or not there was a disposition. She says, so that we can move forward and get to a point of completely severing our financial connections, I would submit, again, the importance of the futurity of this deal. The point was the clean break. My learned friend has already referred to you on a couple of occasions, the point about not hanging around with your hand out. They wanted this finished. They wanted the connection between them to be at an end. Mm. I appreciate the judge found, based on the arguments about the contractual principles, that there was no time being of the essence. Um, we can only speculate as to whether he might have felt differently if this was the key point. Um, but what she goes on to say is your suggestion, as I understand it, is you get sole ownership of your shares and pension. I get the equity from the house, not in the house, not you've given it to me. I get it from the house. Now, as my learned leader has already pointed out, we can't know what she means by equity. Does she mean proceeds? That's certainly what my client referred to. But she says, I get the equity from the house, not in the house, not it's mine right now, which I submit would have been necessary for this to constitute an immediate disposition, which would be allowable under Section 53, rather than the futurity of a contract. Um, the house contents, again, I would submit that goes to the question of sale, savings and income from endowments. Is that right? Question mark. She then goes on, if so, I will accept this. The language of offer and acceptance may mean nothing in the context of lay people, but certainly that's how she saw this. He'd made an offer, she'd accepted it. And will do everything I can to get the house ready for sale as soon as the situation with the oil spill is resolved. She goes on, as you are aware, I am not in a position to pay for the house without your ongoing contribution. So would hope that this continue, can continue until the house is sold. And then there's discussion about if you're serious about buying the house, I suggest we discuss that when the insurance claim is finalised. Well, then, well, that's not the language of obligation, is it? I would hope that this can continue. If he's if he's yes. if he's not handed to the house, he's obliged to keep the 
paying for the mortgage, she wouldn't be saying, I hope it can continue. No, my lady, she wouldn't. But there are later emails in which she is much more explicit about how unhappy she is with my client failing to meet what she describes as his financial responsibilities. Mm. If we have time, mm. I can take you to those later emails. We have provided you with a, a, a slimmed down bundle of what we hope are the most relevant emails in this chain. As I said, the email correspondence bundle at trial was hundreds of pages. And I'm sure that you would not have thanked me for yeah. suggesting. So we've tried to take the most relevant emails. Um, yes, my lady, at this stage, they're talking about contribution. But there are other later emails in which that is much more specifically referred to as obligation and responsibility. Um, what my client's email in response to that is, that's right, appreciate the point about environmental sign-off, obviously the better state, the ha sorry, obviously the better state the house is, I'm assuming that should be in, the more you can get for it, so getting it ready for sale makes sense for you. He then says, under this arrangement, which I would submit can only mean the whole chain, including Ms. Hathaway's response to the email, I have no interest in the house whatsoever, so whilst I will continue to contribute, I won't do so forever. They then talk about estate agents coming round, and then they move on to discussion about him buying the property. Mm. Serious about it, subject being able to sort the finances, and they start some discussion about negotiation of the terms of sale. And, and of course you will know that these arguments were not these arguments, but arguments were run below about whether or not there was in fact a concluded deal, because there's then a course of negotiation between the parties where there's discussion about should the house be sold, will my client buy it, what's going to happen in the future. <coughs> now, I, I have dealt with those key emails as quickly uh, and I hope as concisely as I can. Why would he be buying the property if he still had a share in it? Well, it, it was about releasing, it was about dealing, it was about the point, the point about severing the financial connections between them mm. in my submission. Um, there are later emails in which I certainly, um, it was put to Miss Hathaway that the way in which the later emails are written with the points about your financial responsibility for main, maintaining the property, um, were indications that she considered him still to have a share post-2013. And of course, in my submission, um, the point is that the share transfers properly, legally on sale, whether to him or to somebody else. And of course, there, there are points about, which uh, your lordships probably don't have time for us to deal with, about the fact that, um, depending on whether this is A, B, or C, was there severance? Um, was this sufficient to amount to severance such that his equitable interest was then transferable? Um, there are authorities on it which we haven't had time. Um, arguably, the same act can constitute both severance and disposition. Um, I don't know whether I can, given the um, pressures of time, say more about that. But I would ask that when considering this question, um, your Lordships and your Ladyship look at the later chain of emails and the points about financial responsibility and obligation. Now, I, I'm conscious I've rather galloped through that, but can I assist you any further on this point? When he says on the 9th of September, I've no interest whatsoever in the house, why should that not be understood as meaning, as far as I'm concerned, all my interest in the house. And of course he wasn't living there, huh? she was living there. Huh? So his interest in the house was purely a financial one in receiving half the proceeds of sale when it was sold. And he's agreed that she should have so. So why has he not said in terms, you've got everything that I have? Well, certainly that's not how they interpreted it, which of course is not necessarily the answer. But an another point may be, um, my Lord, that this comes in the context of the conversations about the contamination and the state of the house itself. The, po the point that Jane 
makes in the earlier email is about getting the house ready for sale as soon as the situation with the oil spill is resolved. But what, he's, what, what he's saying in this sentence is, she said, I can't afford it, you'll, you'll need to carry on contributing. And, and he says, well, I will, but I haven't got any ongoing interest in the house, so I won't do it forever. And we know that eventually he does do it for quite a long time and then he stops. Well, you might say that, but of course he does have an interest in the house. It could be, I've no interest in the house until um, once it's sold, but you could also put it in the context of I've no interest in um, the sorting out of the house to make it ready for sale. And of course he would receive no benefit from the contribution that he makes because the mortgage on the property is interest only. So he's not, um, when he's contributing, he's not increasing his interest in the property <coughs> because he's simply paying for Miss Hathaway to continue to live there. Yeah. It's not clear, my lord, in a nutshell. Um, of course, we can't ask him, is the problem. Oh, either one feels you can interpret it objectively but I would say when it's in the context of the discussion about the physical building itself and the difficulties with contamination, it's not as clear in the context as I would submit it's necessary for it to be, for you to be able to interpret those emails to say, I have immediately yeah. disposed of my interest. But you may or may not be with me on that. Was there anything else on this issue? Can I? No. I don't Thank know if I can much. turn my back at so much as can I just lean forward and <laughs> yes. check that that's nothing else that um, yes. I wonder if I could just trouble you with three very quick points just to anticipate. On the on this on ground this yes. issue, right. My Lord, it's been suggested that this point has been sort of conceded at an earlier stage. And I I didn't I, I wasn't sure if my friend was trying to suggest that. My understanding, this issue the, the Three one A, B or C point has never been ventilated, has never been mentioned or conceded by any party to this litigation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's my that's my understanding. Um, the second point is is that in the very first pre-action correspondence on behalf of my client, dated the um, 9th of October. Um, <coughs> Under a heading, Miss Hathaway's position, these very emails are set out and they are attached with our copies of the email. So if, if anybody has overlooked the significance of this point, then both parties have done so. Right. My Lord, the, the third thing I say is that I, given the extent of the debate about what these emails meant insofar as they were in agreement and whether there was any condition attached to these emails, I say it is um, extraordinarily unlikely that there are any other documents that would have been disclosed, given the obligations of standard disclosure, given the obligations of trawling through emails that those instructors really did, to, to, to know that there'd be any other documents that relevant to the interpretation issue. So that's what I wish to say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we will just retire for a few minutes just to see where we are. So don't, please don't leave the courtroom. All right.
on the um, question of the amendment to the respondent's notice, uh, we certainly take note of everything that, what, that, that Mr. Learmont has said. Uh, we will make a final decision in the judgments, which we will hand down in due course. Um, uh, I appreciate that there has been little time for legal research to take place, uh, so we are prepared to give Mr. Learmont seven days, seven working days, in which to put in written submissions, if so advised, and if they are written submissions put in on the question of law raised by the uh, proposed amendment to the respondent's notice, Mr. Horton will have three working days thereafter to reply. Subject to that, uh, we will reserve our judgments. We will get a draft in the usual way in due course. Uh, as you know, the draft comes with a fierce embargo, which means what it says. It may be distributed only to those people who have given their names and email addresses to uh, my clerk before the hearing uh, began. The solicitors will be responsible for distribution of the draft judgments to those people who are entitled to receive it and only to those people. Uh, that will be your opportunity to make typographical corrections and so forth. Uh, it is not an opportunity to challenge our reasoning or to raise new points. We would hope that in the light of the draft judgments that you receive, you will be able to agree a formal order disposing of the appeal. If you can't agree a formal order, please make short submissions in writing and we will make the formal order that we consider appropriate. Thank you all very much for your very help.